I'm uh, Kimberly Reed, Director of Dark Money, and I want to uh, thank CMSI for having me, having us. Uh, many of the folks you've heard from today, Kara at Just Films, and um, Woods, our film wouldn't be here if it weren't for Ford Foundation. Uh, Molly was uh, one of our early uh, advisors for a strategy on the outreach. And uh, our, our friends at Good Pitch and Doc Society are here. That was our first kind of public debut. Um, and uh, of course, we ended up uh, being broadcast on POV and uh, PBS was our dis theatrical distributor as well. Thank you, thank you to all of you. Um, I'm gonna try to figure out how this works. That's me. This is uh, gonna continue our geographical tour around the US by going to Montana. <laughs> this time, which is where I'm from. Um, and I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, uh, take a deep dive into this one particular film. Um, a lot of times, I think with documentary films, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, there's this tendency to sort of make the film, and then once the film is done, you, you take the next step and figure out how you're gonna disseminate it. Uh, especially when that um, regards outreach and engagement strategies. How are you going to put this film in the hands of the people who are going to use it, who are going to be moved by it? And what we wanted to do is to try to talk about those outreach strategies as early as possible. So I'm going to take you into the editing room a little bit um, because we had this theory that if you could tell a story... Um, our film is about money and politics, about secret money and politics. And our theory was that if we could t make a film that would encourage people to follow the money in the film and kind of s tell this mystery story that would unspool and be compelling and engaging for people when they're in the theater, that when they left the theater, they would want to continue to follow the money and continue that civic engagement and conti continue to plug in uh, to government and, you know, do what uh, I think documentary films are sometimes best at. As uh, Pat so kindly uh, said in her introduction, we wanted to start with, in a place that you don't expect with this film about money and politics, <laughs> we start with a bunch of snow geese who actually end up no hard um, numbers yet, but officials of Montana Resources estimate that the number of dead geese is higher than first thought. We start out with a bunch of geese dying um, so that people can understand that we're really talking about a human story with real people that are going through this, not these abstract ideas of money and politics. Um, we uh, go right off the bat to the largest Superfund site in the US, which is the Berkeley Pit in uh, Butte, Montana, which was once known as the richest hill on earth. Um, I am from there and I saw this story uh, developing. I w first became aware of Citizens United, I, I think the way a lot of people heard about this Supreme Court decision, which a lot of people remember as the one that said that um, money is speech and corporations are people, therefore corporations can give unlimited money to political campaigns. And when I heard about that, it sounded like a terrible idea, but I also didn't know what to do about it. I happened to, to notice in my home state that, th that things were becoming arranged in a way that it looked like Montana was going to fight back against Citizens United, and that's ultimately what happened. So grabbed a camera, got in a hold of the characters I knew that I could follow to confront this story, and we ended up going all the way to uh, right down the street. Uh, the Supreme Court, um, Montana had a case that was um, challenging Citizens United, and that was very helpful in the editing room because we could, one of the challenges with such a wonky subject is how do you get this exposition out there? How do you explain the finer points of campaign finance regulations and laws? Um, it was really important that we do that because without that, um, you wouldn't be able to understand the drama that was building up, the laws that were being violated and, and uh, what a challenge enforcement is. And you might be wondering why Montana is the place to go for to tell a story like this. 
And the answer is, you know, this, the, the richest hill on earth and the Berkeley pit that I mentioned a little while ago with these um, that tends to kill large flocks of birds. Um, if you take industrialists in the early 1900s, uh, if you have uh, their money try to buy up politics, do that for about a century, um, change all the laws so that you don't have any regulation controlling mining, this is kind of similar to Molly, what you just saw with Molly, you end up with this, the largest Superfund site in America, which is an enormous pit full of toxic water. Um, and so Montanans were pretty sensitive to this lack of regulation, to the control that money has in a political system that leads to uh, something like this. And so um, I decided to, to, to really dig into the story of money and politics, um, but wanted to do it in contemporary society, uh, in as close to an unfolding verite film as we could. And the way to do that was to find some sort of investigative lens. And I found that uh, in this guy. His name is John Adams. I did not make up that name. Um, <laughs> And he was one of the local reporters who was covering a lot of these stories of money and politics. It took me a long time to convince him to go on camera, but he ultimately did. And he allowed us to really dig away at these, at the influence of money, to follow some of these money trails. Um, I think the general public really understands how corruption and uh, political influence works. Um, people know that all of those dots are out there, so the challenge was just to really connect all those dots. And by following John, as he's following the money, as he's figuring out this investigation, uh, we were able to connect a lot of those dots. And we ended up, you know, with these accidental disclosures and essentially how enforcement is supposed to work, we just ended up with boxes of evidence that were discovered in drug dens in Denver and all sorts of crazy re revelations. There were some whistleblowers who stepped forward and uh, actually the whole thing ends up uh, in a trial, in a courtroom trial, which is very helpful for explicating a lot of these wonky issues. Um, and when you follow an investigative reporter, you can explicate a lot of these wonky issues um, in verity scenes, kind of like this one. To influence our politics. But they don't want the public to know that they're trying to influence our politics because that could hurt their bottom line, perhaps. So they give money to a dark money group. So they send out all of the mud slinging and the postcards and the things that people hate receiving, flooding their mailboxes. This corporation is not affiliated with all of the dark money spending because they've essentially laundered it through this. <laughs> and all of this supports a candidate. When that candidate gets elected, they support the agenda of the corporation. That's the feedback loop for dark money. Corporation funnels money to a PAC. The PAC sends out postcards attacking the opponent of the candidate who they want to get elected. When that candidate gets elected, they support the agenda of the corporation or individual. I mean, this could, this could be done with individual money. It's really, really scary when you think about it, I think, how they can manipulate us through the postcards and through social science research and through analytics and metadata and big data and get us to support their candidates and then get their policy agendas. Then it's not the people controlling the government, it's the government controlled by a corporation controlling the people, which is like super crazy big brother, but it's happening, you know? I mean, that's, to me, that's what this is all about. So, uh, yeah, that was this verite scene. We thought about doing all sorts of fancy animation, and we decided that we just couldn't do better than John Adams at a whiteboard, so we, we went with that one. Um, and so, lest we create too much of a microcosm about how this money in politics works, just limited in Montana, we spend some time in the film kind of bouncing out of this microcosm and 
showing that it can apply to the, the federal level um, and to all the other 49 states. So we take some trips to Washington, D.C., mostly to show just how completely broken uh, campaign finance regulations are at the, at the FEC. Um, we actually shot it in a way to show democracy in a very disjointed and um, skewed manner, which is why you're seeing shots like this. Um, we take a trip to Wisconsin, which is actually where John Adams is from, so that we can contrast effective regulation in Montana with what's going on in Wisconsin, where it basically all campaign finance uh, enforcement fell apart in, in a very short order in the state where progressive politics are really invented in many ways. Um, all, all three branches of government really fell prey to control by dark money. Um, and the whole time what we're doing is following our narrator, hopefully building this substrate of story so that um, as we're watching this happen, um, we gain, hopefully, the audience will understand that this a watchdog press is really important to follow money in politics. And when journalism is under threat, as happens in the life of our, of our main character here, um, what, what we see happen is a, is a surprise twist where John suddenly loses his job as a journalist. And he ends up living in that truck, um, staying at his friend's cabins, shoveling snow instead of writing stories. And uh, what John ultimately does is, uh, um, over the six years that it took to, to shoot this film, he sold his motorcycle because he was broke and lived out of his truck. Um, he actually started up his own nonprofit news agency that's kind of along the, along the lines of ProPublica so that he could take in grants generate uh, income uh, and by, by giving away the stories to local uh, industry, and he could go out and cover the stories that he really wanted to without the pressures of the, what the newspaper industry is going through, fracking stories. Uh, there was one about prison, um, uh, prison pipeline. Uh, he talks about, again, coal mine. Uh, it seems that whenever you follow dark money, you end up with some pretty rampant environmental issues. And so um, doing that, kind of weaving the story together of following the money with the importance of journalism and uh, alternative journalistic uh, business models that John is developing, we end up with um, what we hope is this call to action, again, for our viewers, back where I started, that if we can compel people to follow the money in the film, that they're going to want to follow it on their way out of the theater. And so uh, ultimately what we ended up doing um, is building an outreach and engagement um, strategy that really, as I said, started in the editing room. And we did our best to... Uh, build a tool that we could hand over. There's a very uh, robust um, system of uh, nonprofit organizations that are working for campaign finance reform, and it's been great to hand our film over to them as a tool uh, so that they can use it. I just got an email yesterday that um, a ballot initiative in South Dakota had used uh, dark money, even though they didn't license it, sorry, POV, but they toured around the whole state using this as a call to action to pass a ballot initiative for uh, campaign finance reform. And um, we also uh, wanted to just do more than um, kind of use our outreach strategy to promote ourselves, promote our film. It's great to be able to, to give a tool over to the campaign finance movement, um, but we also wanted to, to uh, continue that evolution, especially because we're looking at a, a really a two-year outreach, at least two-year outreach strategy as we roll into the 2020 election cycle, which we're already well in, I'm sure you all know. And so we're also doing, did some fundraising so that we could create a small pool of grants that we could give to other journalists like John Adams, who are starting up their own nonprofit news services to follow issues like this. 
Um, we also did one last thing uh, that I'll close with is we're in the process of, of uh, developing this open source web plugin. Um, just imagine that any news story that you read that mentions a candidate or an elected official, if you could hover over that name and see who their top five donors are, wouldn't that be cool? That's what we're developing, and we're going to hand that back to. Um, yeah. And then for the, uh, we're also going to try to add by tapping these publicly available databases, also show the indust industries that these people are affiliated with. Um, so yeah. Uh, darkmoneyfilm.com is our website if you want to contact us or there's um, a long list of resources that folks can tap into. Uh, thank you very much. Look forward to your questions. Thank you.